Okay, so we're going to uh, stay in uh, PNG, probably switch to some of the smaller reef fish. And I'm going to take a slightly different tack here, looking at connectivity in relation to both marine reserves and how they work, and uh, but in a situation where we're starting to see uh, habitat damage. Uh, so obviously, the, the, a lot of the uh, key benefits of res reserves are well known. We, we see a lot of reserves where we get larger and bigger and more fish inside the protected area. And we're also getting an increasing amount of uh, information that suggests that reserves can uh, help rebuild natural ecosystem structure from the top down, uh, perhaps a, a sort of a resetting of the balances between predators and prey. Um, quite a few studies have been published along these lines and if you put them all together you start to see this uh, picture of a lot of different uh, interactions from the top down going on depending on whether it's the herbivorous fish that increase, the carnivorous fish or the piscivores. Um, obviously all of these things don't happen in every single reserve but, uh, um, and it's a little bit unpredictable so far at least in terms of uh, what, what we see. Uh, but some of it can help benefit coral health. Uh, the sort of unknown benefits of marine reserves relate more to the connectivity and the larval dispersal and what we've been talking about uh, in this little series of talks. Uh, are reserves self-replenishing? So can an individual reserve of a certain size function as a sanctuary and actually be protecting the next generation in the same Area. We don't have a lot of information about that. Um, we've all obviously been ha had a lot of interest in whether or not reserves can function to help sustain fisheries and so supplement the supply of juveniles outside. Um, we're, and we're starting to get this kind of information. This is what our group's been interested in. And, and, and thirdly, in terms of network design, there's a lot of talk about marine reserve networks, but they're only networks if the larvae go from one protected area to another and reasonable numbers that help sustain those populations. So um, we've been having a look at those kinds of questions and knowledge of larval dispersal is critical. There are some known limitations of uh, marine reserves. So we know that they're not particularly good at protecting certain patches of reef from the larger scale uh, extrinsic disturbances uh, like climate change, like sedimentation and so on. And because they're not so great at doing that. They can't really protect the ecosystem from the bottom up. They can't do much about the effects of habitat change as they sort of percolate up to, to the species that actually use that uh, habitat. So yeah, they're not so necessarily such uh, 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 good managers of uh, those kind of ecosystem interactions. So we need to understand how reserves work when they're sort of coexisting in a landscape or a seascape where we're starting to see habitat damage to try and work out their uh, benefits. And so there's a bunch of unknown limitations and these also relate to these, uh, the lack of information on connectivity and dispersal. Um, so what I'm getting at here, for example, say do damaged reefs uh, or that are reserves depend on the self-recruitment for, for self-replenishment because that's going to be a little bit of a problem. If there's no adults there anymore, they're probably not going to recover. Uh, in terms of uh, the fishery benefit, is it possible that the erosion of habitat structure and declining population actually erodes some of those fishery benefits that we might expect from the, if we had a nice healthy situation where numbers were increasing inside the reserves. And then finally, if it's all a sort of a, a mosaic of disturbances going on inside reserves and uh, outside, can the uh, reserves that happen to escape habitat damage, what sort of role are they going to play in terms of helping regenerate the system uh, later on? Uh, so that's the sort of things I want to talk about. I'll break it down into to two aims. We'll talk, I'll talk first just about a long-term study that we've done, which I guess affirms some of these uh, knowledge of what goes on inside marine reserves. And then uh, talk about uh, the work that we've been doing on uh, trying to fill this gap, larval dispersal and connectivity in terms of how the benefits of reserves might be spread or how reserves might function in terms of helping with recovery following those uh, 
period. So I'm going to take you up the silk PNG, this time to Kimby Bay. And uh, Kimby Bay is obviously a very lovely place to uh, work. So it's a wide bay. It's got 100 meet, about 100 kilometres across the mouth of it, uh, surrounded by volcanoes. Uh, as you go offshore, you plunge into very deep water very quickly. We, go, we get down to two kilometres very quickly. And we get these amazing pinnacles rising up out of deep water to the surface that tend to be uh, smothered uh, with marine life. And uh, uh, one of the things we notice there is a lot of strong associations between fish and uh, a fragile coral structure. Uh, so there are a lot of conservation values there to uh, protect. Uh, but there are issues, um, a lot of uh, communities surrounding that bay, increasing population size and fishing, high fishing pressure, you know, especially on the coastal reefs, so just a few kilometres offshore. And uh, of course, uh, if you've, anyone who's been up there, you realise that all the flat areas are being replaced, the, the forest is being replaced by uh, oil palm. And so there's, there's issues about how all this is, is affecting the coastal reefs. Uh, so one, part one of the story then is really how good our marine reserves are trying to protect reefs in situations where you have this kind of combination of um, activities. So this is uh, Kimby Bay is in fact I think all of PNG's first marine reserves that were fully no take, um, a little conservation area over here near the little NGO where we uh, work. And so what we did, we, were, we, we we got in there three years before the reserves were set up. We helped them set up these little no-take areas. And uh, since then, we've been monitoring them every year. And this has actually gone on to 2013 as well. So we've got a 15-year study of what's happened, how effective these little, little reserves are in that situation. Um, we had uh, four reserves, the outlined in green there. And we also monitored some open areas. And we try to survey as many corals and as many fish as we can in that, that area. Uh, and this is what we got. So we actually got some really encouraging information that these little reserves were working for uh, some fish species. This is the little black uh, surgeon fish, um, the same one that its species status is disputed for the Red Sea. But, uh, you can see we've got the, the exact thing that you'd want to happen in a reserve with numbers being protected inside the boundary. So once the reserves were established, numbers were going up. Um, a little bit of evidence they might have dropped initially in the open areas, but that's remained fairly stable. So we've got the situation now over quite a few years where we've had three or four times the densities of this fish in the closed area. And, uh, Apart from one odd year, we got exactly the same result for another surgeon fish uh, species. And so there is this um, situation where th these are two fish that are actually netted a lot on the, on the reef flats. So they were the sorts of fish that we thought would re should show some sort of positive response to this. Uh, but that's pretty much where the uh, nice positive reserve effects uh, ended. Um, if we look at coral cover, it's, it went down very rapidly to 2002. We had a cycle of recovery and it's since, since then declined again. And what's happening here is this is happening in, both inside and outside the reserves. We're getting exactly the same uh, kind of pattern. So we've lost, I think there's been something like a 50% overall, and that, I think that's the same as, as the reef here actually, there's some 50% decline over that period in terms of... Uh, uh, coral cover. Uh, and so if you look at the rest of the fish in this system, and I could show a lot of graphs like this, this is what happens. Most of the fish, the, the, the orange line there is the uh, Acropora cover. We've got fished and non-fished areas. Uh, but basically all these little fish follow the coral cover. So they declined. Some of them almost went extinct at this point and then picked up again. And uh, the same sort of pattern happening both inside and outside reserves. 53% decline of that species, a butterfly fish. You can almost just overlay these things on, on top of the other uh, huge decline there. And uh, I could show you 50 graphs like this for this area. Um, the, 
other thing that we happen is some fish looks like when they decline with the coral cover, when the coral comes back, they don't actually come back. Um, so they've stayed, and there's quite a few species that fall into that category. I should stress that this is for the coastal reefs, very inshore reefs only, not the entire part of uh, Kimby Bay. Big decline in that species. So look, when you summarise all this, over what, what's been the whole community change over these 15 years that we've been studying this area, uh, a few things have gone up. They tend to be the generalists, the non-coral associated species, and it's within that group that we've seen this positive reserve benefits. Um, we haven't seen it for, for any of the, the other things. Most of these things have uh, uh, coral specialist to some sort of degree. They've declined um, in some cases um, dramatically, so up to 50% or more. So, what we wanted to do was to, to look at this and see really in the larger seascape um, how is a, a network of reserves kind of benefit the situation. For the ones that can increase, is that benefit being spread? And uh, what is the role of connectivity in explaining why some things are recovering and some things aren't? Uh, so this is part two of the story. Look, to, to do our work on connectivity, we switched to cat clownfish. Uh, you might wonder why, why study clownfish, because we don't uh, eat them. Uh, hopefully this is going to work. Um, there is actually a really important reason. There's industries starting up there, uh, aquarium fish collecting industries. They take everything. They take them up to the boat. Uh, they store them. It seems to be fairly indiscriminate from the footage that we've seen. Um, the ones that they don't like, they just they don't have the right colour patterns on them to sell them. They get thrown back into to the ocean where they're probably not going to find a place to, um, to live. Look, this is happening around in some areas. It's been mooted for Kimby Bay. It hasn't happened yet. If it did happen there, it would be incredibly destructive. And the only way really to manage that would be to have some sort of enforced closed area systems to protect the species because they're so shallow, they're so, so accessible. Uh, luckily for Kimby Bay, there is a marine reserve network proposed um, which could help a species like this, um, but we don't have, know how this network works. So what we wanted to do is to, to see whether or not uh, these, th th these do include some no-take areas. You know, what, what's the level of connectivity going on in a network like that at the scale of something like Kimby Bay? Um, so we had to start somewhere. Uh, we picked one of the reserves in the middle of the bay and then the idea was to just span out from there and gradually over a number of years start to try and put together this picture of connectivity in the bay. So just we chose these islands which are kind of like little nodes for the species. Uh, we actually find that this clownfish is particularly abundant in around these little islands and most of these are actually forming nodes of the marine park that has been um, proposed. And so eventually we, we went round the whole bay. Uh, how do we do this? We go to an individual island that we know, we're starting to know these places very well. We've got the anemones GPS, every single reproductive pair on the population in, in these islands is sampled. Uh, we take a little bit of DNA off the tail fin um, that grows back within a couple of weeks. So they're pretty, not too damaged by that. And we just systematically go around the island and get the entire DNA structure for all the reproductive adults in that population. Uh, every two years we go and take a sample of juveniles and what we're simply doing is a DNA parentage analysis of relating those juveniles back to the parents uh, either from that island or as we expand we're obviously getting the connections between the islands. Um, and it works quite reliably for the species because when we get a, an assignment it's usually to both of the adults in the same anemone, so we're very confident about these results. So this was pretty amazing. We've uh, been working on this Kimby Island for quite a few years now, and consistently we're finding around about half the juveniles that turn up at that island are coming from parents on that island. So it's a kind of a semi-closed um, population. To some extent, it could be self, a self-sustaining marine reserve when you've got kind of like ha at least half the juveniles. If you're protecting half the juveniles, some of the adults are at least you know, feeding back into that population, which might help it persist. 
um, whether or not it is, uh, it, it, it can sort of sustain itself on that recruitment or it needs the connections with the other populations is obviously something that we wanted to look at. Um, so we want to know what connects with Kimby Island and where the offspring that are born on Kimby Island end up. Uh, and uh, to cut a long story short, we've been sort of gradually expanding around the bay and in 2009 we went to every single one of these populations uh, inside the bay. So these circles all represent the, uh, the, they are nodes in this marine reserve network and you can see we're getting uh, a fair bit of self-recruitment in each of these different places. We're getting connections from pretty much every reserve to every uh, other reserve in both directions. So you've got you know, juveniles born here and settling down here. You've got juveniles born here, settling up there. Um, there's a, a lot of connections between the populations on this side of the bay. And uh, I'll just get these guys to move. I just wanted to make the point that uh, these guys are going in opposite directions. Uh, that's a 100, 100 kilometre distance. These things are on the plankton for only 10 days. So these are going 10 kilometres a day in both directions right across the mouth of the bay. Um, so um, pretty good evidence, I think, that as a network of reserves, there's a lot of connectivity in that system and that there could be also, um, if one population went extinct, the possibility there would be resurrected. Uh, by others. Um, if you convert that into a dispersal kernel, I really think for the first time in the studies we've kind of empirically defined the, in, the, the length at which at least most of the dispersal is occurring in a species uh, like this. So um, courtesy of Michael Bode, uh, fitting a curve to all of that data we get, well, uh, most of the recruitment's actually <coughs> occurring within 50 kilometres 95% is occurring um, in less than 80 kilometres. So that kind of represents, I think, the scale of dispersal of this species, and it's a fairly closed system within that bay. So the most, most of the offspring, most of the fish that settle in Kimby Bay will be from adults in uh, Kimby Bay. I just want to show you some of the simulation work we've been doing, which actually seems to con uh, support that pattern. Um, so if you release larvae from this side of the bay, you'll see that they spread right across the bay and, and there's a lot of connections in that direction, but most settlement locally. If you release particles on the other side, this is a really fine scale model, they also track back this way. So this kind of helps us explain this um, reverse direction. So we're getting connectivity in both directions from most of these uh, sites. It's because there's a really complex mixing um, in water system in that, that bay. I'll show you the inshore ones, it's so quite interesting. Uh, so releases from some of the big populations down here and I just want to make the point from that that there's probably more retention in the bay, less spillage out into the middle of nowhere uh, from these coastal sites. Uh, but as you move further offshore there tends to be more flushing of juveniles out of the system and in that case they're probably not ending up in places where they would suitably uh, settle, but it does explain a certain amount of self-recruitment at uh, Kimby Island. And just a final thing to, to, to make the point there, if you do a larger scale genetic study, which we have been doing, uh, so this is Kimby Bay here, uh, we've been sampling other populations along the coast, and if you go 100 kilometres or 80 to 100 kilometres down that way, or 80 to 100 up this way, and do a genetic analysis of the, relay, the uh, structure of the populations. It's, it's pretty clear that we're talking about a different population down here, Talili Islands there. It's a different population. So uh, even in evolutionary time or, or long time scales, these populations are not, not really connected. So this information is confirming again what we're sort of getting from all the other bits and pieces of information that Kimby's Bay is fairly close, it's probably one population, most of it self-seeding in that bay. There, there's a slight bit of evidence there might even be some genetic structure across Kimby Bay itself. Uh, so uh, just to, to, to wrap that up, reserves, 
are in that area, they definitely are benefiting. If you exploited species, they tend to be the generalists. But if you're thinking about the fish community as a whole, it is pretty much at the mercy of, of habitat loss. So habitat loss is becoming a critical factor in that bay. I, do, I should make the point at the moment that that habitat loss at the moment is very restricted to the inshore um, reef. So at, at the moment, it hasn't reached a scale that it, it may never be able to recover from. Uh, the network is likely to work very well. There's effective retention within certain sites and a lot of connectivity uh, among the nodes. We think the effective connectivity for Nemo is around about 80 kilometres. And uh, so unless the scale of damage starts, I guess this is a big worry. Once the scale of damage scales up to something like that, then we're going to be in a situation where demographically the species uh, can't recover. Um, and I just thought I'd mention this final point. Uh, one, one possible cause for alarm right now is the fact that um, most, most of the serious damaged reefs are the ones that are really inshore. If they are turning out to be, and we've got to do a little bit more modelling on this, if they're going to be turn, turn out to be more important sources of larvae across the bay, um, then that, that could be uh, an issue that um, could mean that there's a problem coming much quicker. And I'll just call it quits there. Thank you.